testing. No. Hello? Hey, all right, I think it works.
You're welcome. Uh, thank you very much for telling us about the Friends of the Library. I'm a librarian here, and my name is April Younglove. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's third Tuesday author series. Um, if you have uh, hearing aids like I do, uh, and if you're in the audience and they're not quite enough, we actually have uh, extra assistive listening devices. Uh, they'll connect to your T-coil, or you can hook them up to over-the-ear um, audio, and that can help you hear even better. Uh, if you're interested, they're right back there at the table, and a librarian can help you. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce tonight's author, Peter Marbach. Peter Marbach's distinguished career spans three decades creating evocative landscapes of unspeakable beauty. And I've looked at the PowerPoint in advance and cheated, and they really are gorgeous. Uh, he's authored several t uh, coffee table books and has numerous regional and national publication credits. His work has evolved over the years to pursue projects that contribute to the community at large, from working with tribes and First Nations in their quest to restore salmon runs on the Columbia, to his volunteer work in Nepal supporting individual educational advancement for women. His projects have been featured on Oregon Field Guide's OPB Think Out Loud, and recently KGW's Grants Getaway. His 2019 book, Healing the Big River, Salmon Dreams and the Columbia River Treaty, continues to educate the public about the importance of modernizing the Columbia River Treaty. He met and listened to many stories about the impact of the loss of salmon to First Nations after the building of the Grand Coulee Dam. And he's going to share some of those stories with us tonight. If you're interested in purchasing one of his books, 50% of the proceeds will go to the library, and that will be available after the talk. Please give a warm welcome to Peter. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Oh my God, I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> the size of the crowd. Okay. How's the sound? OK, you hear me all right? Yeah, great. Well, thank you. Thank you all for, for coming tonight. This has been a, a long time coming. I was originally scheduled to, to, to speak here um, just prior to the, the pandemic, and that sort of shut things down for a long time for me. So this is one of the uh, few public programs I've been able to give since uh, things have opened up again. So, so thank you again. So yeah, the very beginnings of this project actually go back oh, close to some 21 years ago. Um, I had... Um, I'm, an unfortunate little thing happened to me. I had to r be rushed in for emergency triple bypass open heart uh, surgery in 2001. And um, long story short, the recovery process was a little scary. And I wondered if I'd ever be able to hike or even climb again, because I'm a mountaineer and, and a high altitude photographer. Um, but the Columbia River was the place that I went to often uh, to hike after I got strong enough to heal. And then I can get strong enough, I could hike Dog Mountain. And I thought, well, if I could hike Dog Mountain, then maybe I could get back to my um, place I love the most, standing on the summit of Mount Hood at sunrise. So eight months after my surgery, when I was able to do that, I mean, it was a very emotional uh, moment. But it's hard to see here with, with the lights. But if you look to the far left where the sun is, you can see this little ribbon of water. That's the Columbia River. And while I was up there, I made a promise to myself and I just said something out loud to the universe that at some point in time I was going to do something to thank the river, to honor the river for its role in bringing, bringing me back. So several years went by and I was trying to figure out, well, what is, what do I want to do? I don't just want to do a pretty uh, coffee table book. I want to tell the story of the river. And so around 2014 was when I heard about this thing called the Columbia River Treaty. I had never heard about it and I felt embarrassed that I didn't, didn't know. And I'm not going to get into the weeds and the politics of this whole treaty. Um, but in, in essence, the United States and Canada came to an agreement in the early 1960s to control the Columbia uh, River around the issues of uh, uh, flood, flood management, uh, irrigation, and, and hydropower. At the time of the treaty, they did not invite any tribes or First Nations people to participate in that, which I thought was um, shameful. So when I learned about that, I thought, well, there, there's the story. That's the story that I want to tell. But I knew it was going to take me a long time to do this uh, project. And it ended up being about 12 years of traveling up and down the river to get the, the photography. But I wasn't sure what the story was going to be. But in the end, <clears throat> I was advised to write the story myself. And I said, no, it's not my story. It's the story of the people of the river, the, the tribes and the First Nations people. So miraculously, I reached out to tribal leaders in the US and Canada 
and I got 10 very powerful, distinguished people to lend their voices uh, to the book. And if you get a copy of, of the book, it's not about the photography, it's about the powerful essays and their hopes and dreams for the to return the, the salmon runs. My photography is just the, um, the sort of the eye candy stuff that brings it all together. It's the stories that really matter. So here is a map of, of the Columbia. You can see way up here, uh, Invermere, just before that, is where the Columbia River begins. And most people who live in Portland and the Columbia Gorge area only know the Columbia River as this big, wide river. It's beautiful uh, as it is down here. But really, from the uh, Grand Coulee Dam down to the ocean, it's just a series of lakes. It's not a true free-flowing river. If you really want to see the wild and scenic part of the, uh, of the river, how a real river looks, you've got to make a bucket list trip up to a town called Canal Flats in British Columbia. That's where the river begins in a humble beginnings from an underground spring, and it will blow your mind. When I first saw it, 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 it brought me to tears. I mean, here's this little ribbon going 200 miles north, like you saw on, on, on the cover. This maybe is about 10 yards wide, and that's how it flows, 200 miles north. You have the Rocky Mountains over here, you have the Purcell Mountains, and you're looking at it, and you're like, wow. If only people knew, you know, that we're sort of the ancestry of the river, just like how we take the effort to make to learn about our ancestors. I think it's important to know about the history of the river, how it begins to form a more intimate relationship with the river. That's the beginning of the of the Columbia River. It's even smaller than that. If you go up in the summer, you can see the little place where it literally bur uh, gurgles up out of the ground. Uh, the Kootenai River, which is about a third of a mile away from. Uh, there, it's, it comes very close, but the source of the river is an underground spring, and the water from the Kootenai River bubbles up and forms uh, the, the very beginning. But that's to get this shot, I spent about three hours trying to take a picture of myself. You know, it's, it's not as dramatic just showing the water, but it's, it was pretty um, comical. You know, I'd put it on the tripod and I'd run into position, do the pose, and come back and I'd look at it and, like, well, that's terrible, do it again. So it took, you know, about a couple hours before I, before I finally got one that was. Uh, sort of captured the moment for me, a moment of joy. So again, that's the cover shot. But I actually, I created this, this image maybe, oh gosh, 15, 16 years ago on my first sort of pilgrimage up to the headwaters. And that's when I knew I really had to uh, tell, tell the story. But it's just amazing to see how a river really is instead of how it is down here. So this is one of the more powerful moments I had on, on the journey. This is uh, Alfred Joseph. He is a tribal elder with the Tunaha First Nation in British Columbia. And uh, this is near the town of Invermere, very close to the headwaters of the Columbia River. And they had this wonderful conversation with him. And he, and he told me the story where back in the early 1940s, his, uh, his grandfather told him the story that um, traditionally they'd go down in the early summer and welcome the salmon home. But weeks would go by, months went by, and they couldn't figure out, where's the salmon? What's happened to the salmon? They had no idea that the Grand Coulee Dam had been completed enough some 600 miles downstream that it blocked forever the migration of the salmon. But he said his, his father, uh, the grandfather, thought that the, the creator uh, was angry at them for something, so they, they t he took away the fish from them. So they, they couldn't figure out why this happened. And so for some 80 years now, they've been waiting for the salmon uh, to return, because salmon is everything. Uh, to the tribes in the U.S. and Canada. It's their source of sustenance, it's uh, spirituality, it's so many things to them. And it's a loss of culture that is, uh, needs to be fixed. Oh, this was another um, really wonderful encounter. Uh, this is Deb. Uh, if you hold on just a second, I had a printout and I think I dropped it on the way from the parking lot to here. So this is what, what she had to say. This, she's she's uh, Deb Fisher, she's, she's an e educator for the Métis First Nation. She says, when I talk of the salmon and the immediate loss to a people whose uh, food source to our youth, because no one told the, the Sepawik or the Kunaha that the salmon wouldn't arrive like they had for thousands of years, I like to explain it this way. What would it be like if Martians arrived on North America today and tomorrow they zapped all the cows with no notice no opportunity to discuss or plan for it. It was just done without any thought of how it would affect us as humans. How would that affect us? How would that change our lifestyles? How would we move forward? How would we feed our families this winter when nothing grows, when we were counting on the beef 
we are going to butcher tomorrow. The same goes for wheat. For the youth and the uneducated people of this act, it opens their eyes and they, and they tend to say, this isn't fair, it's wrong. Why would they do this? Or a big, are you friggin' kidding me? That happened here? So there's a lot of emotion, rightly so, connected to this. And again, all these people, I'm only showing you a handful of people I, I met on this journey. I didn't know any of them beforehand. This was just a leap of faith, just going out on the road and taking chances and things all came together. So this is a, an aerial view. I got over my fear of flying in a little two-seater plane to get, to get this shot. But look how the river is. It's just wild and free. These this braided series of things. You have the Kootenai Mountains over here. You have the Purcell Mountains over here. And getting up in the air really gives you a perspective of just how fragile um, this ecosystem is. <clears throat> so I was invited to attend, even though the salmon don't come up there anymore, they have salmon flown in from another part of, of BC, uh, fr frozen, and they still maintain their traditions and ceremonies. Uh, in the first week of, of September, they have a salmon festival, just to still keep the traditions alive, even though the salmon aren't actually coming up there anymore. This is one of those just, just pure beauty shots. I was driving north uh, lo looking for a, a, a shot and I saw this beautiful light. But what you don't see here is a rail set of railroad tracks and a bunch of blackberry bushes that were about 10 feet wide and, and this tall. But I was determined, I said, how do I get this shot? So I just took my tripod and lessons learned from growing up with a mother who was obsessed with picking blackberries. We always found ways to make a path. And I took my tripod and just bored through and I got down to the edge of the river just in time to be able to get this image, but uh, definitely a lot of damage to my boots and pants that day, but I didn't care. Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do to get the shot. Damn it. So this is uh, another aerial view of Mount Co Columbia. It's the highest peak um, in, in the general area there. It's about 13,000 feet. I had planned to try to, to climb it for this project, but I was told that there's no view of the Columbia, so I said, well, why bother? So I, I didn't do it. <laughs> but from the Columbia ice fields where that peak is located, uh, there is some drainage that goes down into to, to feeds the Columbia. And this is what they call the, the bush arm, which flows down from the Columbia ice field and flows into the Columbia River right there. But you can just see just how dramatic the scenery is up there. So this is the uh, Revelstoke Dam, one of three dams that were built since the enactment of, of, of the treaty. And this is where the wild and free section of the Columbia River ends. It goes about 200 miles, and then from this point on, it's just dammed all the way to the ocean. And this is a, uh, a little creek on the, when you're coming around uh, over beyond the Revelstoke Dam that feeds into the Arrow Lake. And in Canada, Canada serves as a big sort of a storage holder for a lot of water. And that's part of the negotiations in the treaty. They've been ho the holding back water for demands when the U.S. needs it for, ele for electricity and flood control purposes. So part of what's going on in the negotiations is that the United States thinks they're paying Canada too much money, and Canada thinks they're not getting enough money. So they're trying to come to a, an agreement on it as, as one, one aspect of this renegotiation. And this is the, the same lake, but this runs for a couple hundred miles. Um, to get this shot, I had to climb up at Mount Cartier, which is about 8,400 feet. And you can just see, again, the, the, the beauty of it. But again, right here, this is all just stored up. And in the, the drier seasons, it's, it's very narrow, but they hold it back for, for U.S. consumption. This is just one of those quirky um, things right at the U.S.-Canada border, uh, where the Columbia River comes in near, near trail. It was almost as if nature had drew this line across across the river, so it was irresistible uh, to me to, to take this photograph. Pardon me? Yes. Yeah, it's, well, let me back up. I don't know what kind of, uh, what kind of stone it is, but yeah, it's just natural. That's what I meant, it's sort of like a natural m m mark, yeah, yeah. So this is one of the more uh, beautiful experiences I got to have. I was invited by the Upper Columbia uh, United Tribes to witness their annual uh, canoe journey. So some of the tribal youth, they get to learn how to make a canoe from, from, from cedar. 
So they spend six months working with a master woodworker, and they carve out the canoe, and then they paddle down from the U.S.-Canada border all the way down to Kettle Falls. Now, Kettle Falls, if you're familiar with Celilo Falls, Kettle Falls was the version of Celilo Falls in, in Washington State. Um, tribes came from all over the U.S. and Canada for thousands of years. To, as it was a trading post. It was a place for families to visit. They exchanged uh, beads and jewelry and, and fish. Um, and what you're seeing here is a stone that was rescued that was down at, at the riverbank. This is high on the cliff. If you look at it, you see all these lines going through it. That's not natural. That's from a few thousand years of fishermen sharpening their knives and their fishing I implements into the stone. And when you take your fingers and you put it right into the grooves, it is like smooth as, as a diamond blade. It's incredible. And you can almost feel the, the energy and the spirituality um, of that. So it was fortunate that somebody had the good sense to rescue this, this boulder. And so this was a very um, powerful um, moment. Um, what they're doing here, tribal members, they're tossing stones into the river. And this is to remember um, the salmon, because when the salmon would come up the river, the, the stories go that the salmon would listen to the rolling uh, clicking of the rocks along this. So they, the, the tribe says that they're, they're throwing the rocks back in there and they're clicking the stones together once more to remind the salmon that they're still here, that they're waiting for them, and that their, their prayers and hopes are that it will come someday. So this is what I call the, um, the, the mother load of the bad stuff. This is the, the Grand Coulee Dam built in, in circa 1940s. Um, the U.S. and Canada had the option to install a fish ladder. They agreed not to. They said it was going to cost a lot of money. It was going to eat into their profits. So there was no concern or moral compassion for what was going to happen to the tribes and to the salmon runs. And I heard so many stories from tribal elders where even after this, uh, the dam was built, the salmon kept coming, and they were throwing themselves against the walls of it, still trying to get over. And the tribes uh, were standing, watching this, and just crying, because there was nothing they could do. So there's thousands of carcasses of, of dead fish. Um, I can't even imagine what that would have been like. So yeah, again, um, major entities making decisions that were you know, good for them, but not for tribes and, and fish. So. The previous shot was a, was a dam during the daylight, right? Well, they had this really kind of Walt Disney uh, show from um, Memorial Day weekend through Labor Day weekend where they play music and they show the, um, the power of the, of the dam. It's sort of like a, a very, uh, it's a glorification and a justification of, of why they did this dam. And they have little cartoons, they have li little beavers, and it looks like a, 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 a a uh, you know, Walt Disney type thing. But it was um, rather entertaining, but lots of people come down to watch it and they they buy the story. So this is another really beautiful moment. This is Randy Friedlander from the Colville tribes. What he's doing here, we're right at the base of the Grand Coulee Dam. In the spring, when he ha goes down to the Okanagan River, a tributary, he catches the fish, he cleans them, and what he does is he brings the remains, the carcasses, and he dumps them in the river near the base of the Grand Coulee Dam. And while he's doing this, he's saying a prayer uh, to honor the salmon and apologize at the same time uh, for what has happened. But his, his prayer is that if the carcass is in the river, that their spiritual DNA will be there. So one day when the salmon do, do return, they'll say, ah, our ancestors are here. This is the way. It was really beautiful. I mean, I was just fighting back tears the whole time. Funny thing was, right by his feet, he had, had the salmon in a, in a Safeway bag, and there was like blood dripping all over the place. And then I said, Randy, do you mind like moving that bag a little bit just to kind of clean up the shot? But you know. So this is, this is interesting, one of the more innovative uh, um, possibilities for salmon uh, reintroduction. There's a company called Whoosh. And it's actually just like it sounds, like W-H-O-O-S-H. And they've created um, this invention where they create a false little waterfall at this barge down here. And it sucks the fish in, and it shoots them. They can shoot them 250 feet, 300 feet through the air. But the, the inside of it is lined with this protective goo, I would just call it, so that there's 95% uh, survival rate. So they've, they've demonstrated it on various dams along the river. Uh, but so far, the Department of um, the Cor Army Corps of Engineers has not approved it to be for official use. So they're still um, 
hoping and waiting, but it's one of the options to get the fish up and over the dams without having to spend a lot of money on retrofitting dams. Um, we'll see. So this is <coughs> my one and only shot that I got of uh, sockeye salmon underwater. I was told by uh, the leaders of the Okanagan Nation in British Columbia that in mid-October that they have a run of like thousands and thousands of salmon and for sure you'll easily get a shot. So I you know, took a couple day journey to get up there and I was in the water with my camera uh, underwater and here would come the, the salmon like from where I am to like where you folks are sitting and they would come that close and all of a sudden they'd go whoosh, way far away from me. So for like three days I kept getting into the river. I'm like, come on guys, I'm here to help you. So it was like as if you know, one of them said, hey, go help this guy out. So this one fish broke off from the pack and he came over and just sat there for a couple of minutes in order for me to get one or two shots and then he left. Um, so anyway, that's pretty cool. It looks like the water's moving. Uh, come on. So this is um, further down the river near the uh, uh, Wanapum Dam. Um, this is Wainema Drima, this was her name. And this particular a band of a, a tribe, they're known for their uh, for horses being an important part of their culture. So we, we arranged, I had requested to do a, a sunrise shoot at a certain location. And when I got there, the um, uh, leader of the group texted me and saying, well, you know, kids, they, they couldn't get up at sunrise. So it was like two and a half hours after sunrise. And I thought, well, what am I going to do? What can I do? So I was, she was coming by in the horse and I said, stop, it's right there. We'll, we'll do this sort of silhouetted thing. So, you know, it's... A lot of what happens, you have to sort of make do and make adjustments on the fly. So now we're in the, uh, the stretch of where the Hanford River is, and I was trying to figure out, well, I'm in the Hanford the nuclear area, and I thought, well, how can I make something scenic out of this without including the nuclear reactors and all this stuff? So I was hiking around, and I saw these massive sand dunes um, on, the, on one side of the river, so I just climbed to the top and just put the sand um, in, in the foreground. So al along the stretch, the Hanford stretch, there is there is a, an area where the juvenile salmon uh, come come down, and the uh, staff from the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission uh, catch the juvenile salmon, in with using these uh, traditional nets, and then they barge them. They put them in a truck and they take them down to the barges they could put on the um, on the barges in the Columbia River, and then they're shipped downstream to the hatcheries and then eventually released back out to the ocean. So. It is a way of keeping the salmon runs alive, but they're not, you know, wild salmon. So this I just had to do because it's a, uh, a tributary that flows into the snake. This is a Palouse Falls in Washington State. It's one of the more beautiful um, state parks. You can camp there, but I had always wanted to go there. So this is the shot. Actually, it's um, early evening, but to get this exposure, I just did a really long, like 20 second exposure but it flows down into the Snake River, which is a major tributary uh, to the Columbia River. And again, to show just the, 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 breadth, the breadth and depth of this region, this is the Snake River. I got into the airplane one more time to show the Snake River as it flows into the Columbia. It's hard to see, but the Columbia River is at the very top uh, there. And right now there's a lot of, uh, you may have heard in the news, there's a lot of um, excitement that uh, some of the dams in the Snake River are under serious consideration for being uh, removed or at least uh, altered so the salmon runs can come back. Uh, Governor Inslee and the state senators are really pushing to make this happen, but uh, you know, fingers crossed. That may be one of my future projects working on, on that. So now we're into Washington State. Um, this is the uh, what they call the uh, Wallula Gap. And this is the, the, the Twin Sisters. Um, it's a basalt uh, outcropping um, near on the reservation of the Columbia um, United Tribes of the um, Umatilla Reservation. And it's very important in their uh, mythology. But to get this shot, I had to park along the highway and run up this hillside to get it just as the sun was uh, coming over the hills. This is uh, Jeremy a Red Star uh, Wolf. He is a leader with the Columbia, uh, with the Umatilla tribes. And he invited me to come out with his son, Aiden, because uh, he was introducing Aiden to their 10,000-year-old uh, tradition of dip net fishing. Now, you may have seen some of the, these examples of it on the Columbia River um, 
on the click attack river where they use much larger uh, dip nets on the platforms but this is much smaller but i had a wonderful experience of watching him teach teach his son um how to do it because uh, this is the 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 umatilla river a very narrow section of it and it was just great fun watching him and they caught w one fish but it was a really beautiful bonding experience this is one of those things that took just um <laughs> a lot of luck and a lot of planning uh, bighorn ship sheep were reintroduced uh, into the Columbia River Gorge oh, maybe 12, 15 years ago. And I knew the general area where they were. So I just one of those days I, I went out and parked my car. But it's hard to see them because the whole landscape there is very brown and muddy anyway. So suddenly I, I could see this, this, this motion. And there are two of them were kind of walking down the hill. Old, and I kept hoping, praying that they would do the headbutt thing but they were like standing maybe 15 yards apart and they were just grazing on the grass and they would look at each other and every now and then they would get up like they were gonna do it and then they'd pause and I'm like, geez, guys, come on, I came all the way out here. So they, they finally did, it was just like really fast to get it. But it was, it was funny, it was almost like the cartoons because when they do it, they, they, they're kind of dazed afterwards, they kind of feel like they're gonna fall over. So it was uh, pretty fun, but to get the shot, I had to hide behind a rock and lay on the ground and I was like a military guy in the ground just sort of crawling forward to try to, try to get close enough. Uh, this is, uh, now we're in the Columbia River Gorge. This is uh, near the town of Wishram. This is one of the uh, more beautiful um, petroglyphs um, in the Columbia R River Gorge. Um, I'll just say that it's in Wishram and not say much, much else because unfortunately a lot of the uh, beautiful uh, rock art and petroglyphs has been uh, vandalized. Um, but this is one of the more beautiful ones and it's a hidden place. You have to be kind of a, a mountain goat um, person to be able to climb and trek to get up there to, to get this shot. So uh, yeah, it's quite beautiful and it's still there. This was another powerful moment. This was 2007, it was the um, 50 years commemorating the, um, the press calls it the anniversary, the celebration of the, the creation of the Dalles Dam, but the tribes m m really refer to it as a, as a commemorative moment, a sad moment, because it, it forever changed the way uh, Salilo Village was and the Salilo Falls was gone forever. Uh, so, but it, it was a beautiful day because these people, uh, different tribes came down from the Pacific Ocean, from Canada, B Montana, and they all came down in these canoe journeys and they came to the shore of the Salilo Village and this is when they arrived with their paddles up asking permission from the local chief to come ashore. Just quite quite moving experience. And this, uh, again, this is another example of the uh, dip net fishing. This is uh, um, near Fisher uh, Bridge on the Klickitat River um, from April through the fall. Anybody can go witness this. There, there's a dirt road. You can drive and park your car and watch. But you can see this, this gentleman, look at the, the length of the pole and the strength it takes uh, to be able to do that, but to be able to get, to able to get this shot, I had to time it when he, there was one moment where he stopped. Otherwise, it would be blurry the whole time because it was a long exposure. You can see the blurriness here. So I took many, many shots practice to try to get it uh, just right. Uh, but this is one of the more um, safe approaches. I've seen uh, Yakima fishermen standing on, on way more dangerous things with ropes tied around them. Um, just incredible that there's not more issues. And at that same falls, I waited for, I can't even tell you how many hours to get one shot of a fish trying to get up and over, but the effort that they make is pretty powerful. It's just how they do that, the dynamics to do that is, is fascinating. Um, this was one of the, um, another one of those be beautiful uh, days. This is a rosebud um, whipple. Um, I was fortunate enough to meet her, her, her mother, uh, Bridget McConville, who also contributed a poem in, in, in this book. And they invited me to photograph them uh, harvesting uh, their traditional spring harvest of uh, roots for the Warm Springs uh, Reservation. So this is on the Warm Springs land. But this was a long time ago. She's now, I, I just saw a post where she's like in her mid 20s and ab about to have uh, her first baby. This was back when she was just a little kid. So now this is, you know, people climb Dog Mountain every year to for, for the wildflowers and the scenery. Uh, but for this project, I wanted to just sort of s show something a little bit different. So I w went up there, uh, whenever the forecast calls for unstable weather, I always know there's gonna be a moment where there's an opening where you might get some dramatic light. So this was just at sunset. It had been raining and hail and just nasty, nasty weather. I was hiding in some trees and I jumped out. 
just in time to get this. So, you know, we all know what the gorge looks like down here, but when I've given talks in Washington State or up in Canada, people have no idea what the Columbia Gorge looks like. So a uh, little bit different take on Dog Mountain. So this is in uh, a ridge, ridge field. This is at a um, plank house uh, with, with the, uh, a grand rond. And this is some of the traditional um, artwork there. I, just, I love the balance here between the light on this, on this carving and the wood uh, in the background. And again, it's at the ridge field. There's a plank house and they have uh, activities uh, open to the public. So now we're at, we're at the terminus of the Columbia River, and this is at Cape Disappointment uh, State Park. Uh, this is one of those images where um, you know, the forecast called for it. it was a king tide, high tide, and thunder and lightning storm. So I knew there'd be some, a little bit of drama, but it was raining like all day. I laid on the ground for like five hours, and finally it let up just enough to be able to get this, this swirling action. But you saw the, the, the picture of me standing at the Columbia River this wide, and then when you get to the, to the end, it's this three mile wide uh, confluence with the Pacific Ocean and the calmness of it. So to have been able to spend, you know, 12, 13 years of my life uh, going up and down the river, it's quite amazing. Uh, you really form a deeper understanding and a, and a really intimate relationship with the river. So this was um, a really a magical moment. This was um, just, gosh, 2018, I think. Um, Above the Grand Coulee Dam, the tribes were allowed to do what's called cultural releases. Uh, so they, were, they introduced salmon into the waters for the first time above the Grand Coulee Dam. And it was a very electric moment. We had tribes coming from all over the, the Northwest and as far as away as British Columbia. And they uh, trucked salmon in in these uh, protective uh, co coolers. And they formed a line passing the salmon down. And people were so excited, uh, elders were, were crying. And I had to stand in the water to get this shot. And there was one point where one of the salmon went by and brushed right by my leg and just felt like this electricity of the hair standing up in my neck. And I turned around and I could see it heading off up toward Canada. And I was just like, oh man, well, what an honor to be of, able to witness that. So <clears throat> again, as I said, I'm not gonna get into the whole politics of it because there's not enough time, but what the tribes are pushing for is something called ecosystem function. And, it, and you, you, you can read it here, it basically has to do with improving the water and the flow of the water so that salmon have an opportunity to, to return and restoring it. And they want this to be just as important as flood management, irrigation, and hydropower in the treaty talks to bring it up to that level, not just have it be an afterthought. They want it to be a main part of the treaty negotiations. And that's what I'm um, hoping. But it's interesting, I found this on the Corps of Engineers website. And if you see the language here, it says, some parties involved in discussions on the treaty's future, consider ecosystem issues comparable to those of power generation. So you can see the perspective that the um, powers that be, you know, refer to tri uh, the tribal uh, um, request as some people. They don't just go out and say that. So it's, uh, unfortunately, uh, all things are political. So there's a lot of different websites that you can go to find out more information. So if you're curious at all, this will be, I'm gonna leave this up here. This is a moment to take your cell phones out and take a screenshot. But the, our State Department has a website. The British Columbia uh, Foreign Affairs has a, has a website. Locally, Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission, they have information uh, as well. And OPB had a really great interview um, last year um, about what happens uh, during the negotiations and wh what the expectations are. Nobody really knows because the treaty is a closed door thing. So um, there's been 17 different rounds of discussions and meetings, um, both in DC, Vancouver, and all throughout the Pacific Northwest and British Columbia. So um, they're supposed to finish it all up by the end of the summer of 2024. So we're, we're in the final year. So I'm, I'm hoping to do more of these things and educate more people, get back on the road, give more talks, and just remind people that you know this is a precious resource and it's now, now's the time to right the wrongs of the past. So. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and I forgot to, m to mention, I am uh, sell selling the book here. I'm donating 50% of the proceeds uh, to the library. Um, if you'd rather wait, you can go to my website and purchase a book there, and, and I'll donate uh, proceeds to the library as, as well. So, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to. 
attempt is twenty nine ninety five and I sign it and my signature is free no no extra charge um, yeah so if you have a, any other questions I'll try to answer them yes sir oh yeah forgive me for not mentioning that um, they are but not in an official capacity they're um, the Canadians were far more progressive than that. They started early on a couple of years ago where they invited three different tribes to be <coughs> uh, observers and to uh, they welcomed their input. But it's only in the last couple of years that the United States has invited, I think, the Colville tribes, the Coeur d'Alene tribe, and I can't remember the, uh, the other one, to also be an official observer. But they don't have final say at the, in the negotiations. They, it's sort of like you know when politicians go on listening tours. They listen to them. You know, they take their advice and whether or not it'll be incorporated in, into the um, final renegotiations, I'm not sure. There, there's hope. But I also, I, I've heard informally from tribes that whatever happens that uh, if there's not an agreement reached, they're just going to go forward on their own and start doing reintroduction because they have the right to. You know, the, the 1855 treaty basically said that they have the rights for their usual and accustomed places to fish for eternity. And promises have been broken along the way. So. They're tired of waiting. Yes? Well, it's the, our State Department and um, the, the Foreign Affairs Office of, of Canada. Um, there are f the, U the U.S. entities are the Bonneville Power Administration, the Department of, of the Interior, uh, I think NOAA Fisheries, and um, you probably know since you were with the Gorsuch, I'm, I'm, trying, I'm forgetting the other one, but there are four um, entities um, on, on the United States side. So, and then Canada has, has four entities as well. Pardon me? No, not, not, not Indian Affairs. No, yeah, I, it'll, it'll come to me probably like at 2 a.m. So, okay, but anyway, but it's uh, on any of these websites, you, you, you can find that, that information. But, but, but the basic essence of this 10-year thing, it's the only component that is up for serious renegotiation is the flood control stuff. Everything else remains um, a, as is. The treaty is not the be all and end all for the restoration of it. This was just a, a golden opportunity to revisit it, to try to get the powers that be to to do the right thing. You know, but there's 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 always politics involved. There's money involved. There's profits. There's pressure from politicians. Um, you know, grain growers on the, on the on the Columbia River and Snake River who don't want to see things changed. Um, so yeah, it's 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 a tough uphill battle. Yes. I think if the treaty is uh, agreed upon, I think there is a ratification process as well. Yeah, I don't know, but in the in the book, there's a wonderful preface uh, written by a um, journalist from Idaho who has a lot more details uh, about it. But yes, I think there is some sort of uh, ratification process. Yeah, yeah. And we have a, a friendlier administration right now who's more friendly to this. And we have the head of the Department of Interior is the first Native American woman. Chuck Sams is, is the director of the National Park Service. So there's a a more welcoming environment than there was years ago. Yeah. So. Um, it is not, but it just, my name is, is, is on the book. If you just go to uh, petermarbach.com, uh, you can buy the book there, but it's, it's here today. Peter Bohutsky. Peter uh, well, the brief story around that is that um, when I was working on this project, I was impressed by the tight-knit relationships with tribes and their families. And my mother, Ethel Pohutsky, uh, passed away 11 years ago, so she didn't have the opportunity to see this. And it got me to thinking about that she was the last of her clan. And so I had made a decision that going forward to any book, any project that, uh, that I would have going forward, I was going to include uh, her name as sort of my official artistic name as a way of, uh, of honoring her. Native to Poland. When I say her clan, I, uh, 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 that, that, that's my clan. That's my heritage. Yeah. So that's, that's just my artistic name. Just Yes. Sure. Go to my website. You can buy it there, and just just send me a little note saying, "Hey, I was at the library," and that way I'll know who you are, so that I can make a donation to the library. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Okay. Thanks.